This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Chapter 13, recorded by Bob Foster, Montreal, March 2006. The summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace. Far away in the west the sun was setting, and the last glow of all too fleeting day lingered lovingly on sea and strand, on the proud promontory of dear old Houth, guarding as ever the waters of the bay, on the weed-grown rocks along Sandy Mount shore, and, last but not least, on the quiet church whence there streamed forth at times upon the stillness the voice of prayer to her who is in her pure radiance a beacon ever to the storm-tossed heart of man mary star of the sea the three girlfriends were seated on the rocks enjoying the evening scene and the air which was fresh but not too chilly many a time and oft were they wont to come there to that favourite nook to have a cosy chat beside the sparkling waves and discuss matters feminine Sissy Caffrey and Edie Boardman, with the baby in the push-car, and Tommy and Jackie Caffrey, two little curly-headed boys, dressed in sailor suits with caps to match, and the name HMS Belial printed on both. For Tommy and Jackie Caffrey were twins, scarce four years old, and very noisy, and spoiled twins sometimes, but for all that, darling little fellows with bright merry faces and endearing ways about them. They were dabbling in the sand with their spades and buckets, building castles as children do, or playing with their big colored ball happy as the day was long. And Edie Boardman was rocking the chubby baby to and fro in the push car, while that young gentleman fairly chuckled with delight. He was but eleven months and nine days old, and, though still a tiny toddler, was just beginning to lisp his first babyish words. Sissy Caffrey bent over him to tease his fat little plucks and the dainty dimple in his chin. "'Now, baby,' Sissy Caffrey said, "'say out big, big, I want a drink of water.' And baby prattled after her. "'A jink, a jink, a jopo. Sissy Caffrey cuddled the wee chap, for she was awfully fond of children, so patient with little sufferers, and Tommy Caffrey could never be got to take his castor oil unless it was Sissy Caffrey that held his nose, and promised him the scatty heel of the loaf of brown bread with golden syrup on it. What a persuasive power that girl had! But to be sure, baby was as good as gold, a perfect little doat in his new fancy bib. None of your spoilt beauties, Flora Mac Macflimsy sort, was Sissy Caffrey, a true-hearted lass never drew the breath of life, always with a laugh in her gypsy-like eyes and a frolicsome word on her cherry-ripe red lips, a girl lovable in the extreme, and Edie Boardman laughed, too, at the quaint language of little brother. But just then there was a slight altercation between Master Tommy and Master Jackie. Boys will be boys, and our two twins were no exception to this golden rule. The apple of discord was a certain castle of sand which Master Jackie had built, and Master Tommy would have it right go wrong that it was to be architecturally improved by a front door like the Martello Tower had. But if Master Tommy was headstrong, Master Jackie was self-willed too, and, true to the maxim that every little Irishman's house is his castle, he fell upon his hated rival and to such purpose that the would-be assailant came to grief and, alas to relate, the coveted castle too. Needless to say, the cries of discomfited Master Tommy drew the attention of the girlfriends. "'Come here, Tommy,' his sister called imperatively, "'at once, and you, Jackie, for shame to throw poor Tommy in the dirty sand. Wait till I catch you for that.' His eyes misty with unshed tears, Master Tommy came at her call for their big sister's word was law with the twins, and in a sad plight he was after his misadventure. His little man-o'-war 
top and unmentionables were full of sand but Cissy was a past mistress in the art of smoothing over life's tiny troubles and very quickly not one speck of sand was to be seen on his smart little suit. Still the blue eyes were glistening with hot tears that would well up so she kissed away the hurtness and shook her hand at Master Jacky the culprit and said if she was near him she wouldn't be far from him her eyes dancing in admonition. Nasty bull, Jackie, she cried. She put an arm round the little mariner and coaxed winningly. What's your name? Butter and cream? Tell us who is your sweetheart, spoke Edie Boardman. Is Sissy your sweetheart? No, tearful Tommy said. Is Edie Boardman your sweetheart? Sissy queried. No, Tommy said. I know, Edie Boardman said none too amiably with an arch glance from her short-sighted eyes. I know who is Tommy's sweetheart. Gertie is Tommy's sweetheart. No, Tommy said on the verge of tears. Sissy's quick mother-wit guessed what was amiss and she whispered to Edie Boardman to take him there behind the push-car where the gentleman couldn't see into mind he didn't wet his new tan shoes. But who was Gertie? Gertie MacDowell, who was seated near her companions, lost in thought, gazing far away into the distance, was in very truth as fair a specimen, specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see. She was pronounced beautiful by all who knew her, though, as folks often said, she was more a gill-trap than a MacDowell. Her figure was slight and graceful, inclining even to fragility, but those iron jelloids she had been taking of late had done her a world of good, much better than the widow Welch's female pills, and she was much better of those discharges she used to get and that tired feeling. The waxen pallor of her face was almost spiritual in its ivory-like purity, though her rosebud mouth was a genuine Cupid's bow, Greekly perfect. Her hands were of finely veined alabaster, with tapering fingers and as white as lemon juice and queen of ointments could make them, though it was not true that she used to wear kid gloves in bed or take a milk foot-bath either. Bertha Supple told that, once, told that once to Edie Boardman a deliberate lie when she was black out at Dacker's drawn with Gertie. The girl chums had, of course, their little tiffs from time to time, like the rest of mortals, and she told her not let on whatever she did that it was her that told her or she'd never speak to her again no honour where honour is due there was an innate refinement a languid queenly hauteur about gertie which was unmistakably evidenced in her delicate hands and high arched instep had kind fate but willed her to be born a gentlewoman of high degree in her own right and had she only received the benefit of a good education, Gertie MacDowell might easily have held her own beside any lady in the land and have seen herself exquisitely gowned with jewels on her brow and patrician suitors at her feet vying with one another to pay their devoirs to her. Mayhap it was this, the love that might have been, that lent to her softly featured face at whiles a look, tense with suppressed meaning, that imparted a strange yearning tendency to the beautiful eyes, a charm few could resist. Why have women such eyes of witchery? Gertie's were of the bluest Irish blue, set off by lustrous lashes and dark expressive brows. Time was when those brows were not so silkily seductive. It was Madame Vera Verity, directress of the woman beautiful page of the princess novelette, who had first advised her to try eyebrown, eyebrow line, which gave that haunting expression to the eyes, so becoming in leaders of fashion, and she had never regretted it. Then there was blushing scientifically cured, and how to be tall, increase your height, and you have a beautiful face but your nose. That would suit Mrs. Dignam, because she had a button one. But Gertie's crowning glory was her wealth of wonderful hair, it was dark brown with a natural wave in it, 
She had cut it that very morning on account of the new moon and it nestled about her pretty head in a profusion of luxuriant clusters and pared her nails too, Thursday for wealth. And just now at Edie's words, as a telltale flush, delicate as the faintest rose-bloom, crept into her cheeks, she looked so lovely in her sweet girlish shyness that of a surety God's fair land of Ireland did not hold her equal. For an instant she was silent with rather sad, downcast eyes. She was about to retort, but something checked the words on her tongue. Inclination prompted her to speak out. Dignity told her to be silent. The pretty lips pouted a while, but then she glanced up and broke out into a joyous little laugh, which had in it all the freshness of a young May morning. She knew right well, no one better, what made Squinty Edie say that because of him cooling in his attentions when it was simply a lover's quarrel? As per usual, somebody's nose was out of joint about the boy that had the bicycle always riding up and down in front of her window. Only now his father kept him in the evening, studying hard to get an exhibition in the intermediate that was on, and he was going to Trinity College to study for a doctor when he left the high school like his brother W. E. Wiley who was racing in the bicycle races in the Trinity College University. Little recked he perhaps for what she felt, that dull aching void in her heart sometimes, piercing to the core, yet he was young and perchance he might learn to love her in time. They were Protestants in his family, and of course Gertie knew who came first, and after him the Blessed Virgin and then St. Joseph but he was undeniably handsome, with an exquisite nose, and he was what he looked, every inch a gentleman, the shape of his head, too, at the back, without his cap on, that she would know anywhere something off the common, and the way he turned the bicycle at the lamp with his hands off the bars, and also the nice perfume of those good cigarettes, and besides they were both of a size, and that was why Edie Boardman thought she was so frightfully clever, because he didn't go and ride up and down in front of her bit of a garden. Gertie was dressed simply, but with the instinctive taste of a votary of dame fashion, for she felt that there was just a mite that he might be out. A neat blouse of electric blue, self-tinted by dolly dyes, because it was expected in the ladies' pictorial that electric blue would be worn, with a smart V opening down to the, di to the division, and kerchief pocket, in which she always kept a piece of cotton wool scented with her favorite perfume, because the handkerchief spoiled the sit. And a navy three-quarter skirt cut to the stride showed off her slim, graceful figure to perfection. She wore a coquettish little love of a hat, of wide-leaved nigger straw contrast, trimmed with an underbrim of egg-blue chenille and at the side a butterfly bow to tone. All Tuesday week afternoon she was hunting to match that chenille, but at last she found what she wanted at Clary's summer sales. The very it, slightly shop-soiled, but you would never notice, seven fingers, two, and a penny. She did it up all by herself, and what joy was hers when she tried it on then, smiling at the lively reflection which the mirror gave back to her, <clears throat> and when she put it on the water jug to keep the shape, she knew that that would take the shine out of some people she knew. Her shoes were the newest thing in footwear. Edie Boardman prided herself that she was very petite, but she never had a foot like Gertie McDowell, a five, and never would ash, oak, or elm. With patent toe caps and just one smart buckle at her high-arched instep, her well-turned ankle displayed its perfect proportions beneath her skirt, and just the proper amount, and no more, of her shapely limbs encased in fine-spun hose, with high spliced heels and wide garter tops. As for undies, they were Gertie's chief care, and who that knows the fluttering hopes and fears of sweet seventeen, though Gertie would never see seventeen again, can find it in his heart to blame her. 
She had four dinky sets with awfully pretty stitchery, three garments and nighties extra, each set slotted with different coloured ribbons, rosepink, pale blue, mauve and peagreen and she aired them herself and blued them when they came home from the wash and ironed them and she had a brickbat to keep the iron on because she wouldn't trust those washerwomen as far as she'd see them scorching the things. She was wearing the blue for luck, hoping against hope, her own colour, and the lucky colour too for a bride to have a bit of blue somewhere on her because the green she wore that day week brought grief because his father brought him into study for the intermediate exhibition and because she thought perhaps he might be out because... When she was dressing that morning she nearly slipped up the old pear on her inside out and that was for luck and lovers' meetings if you put those things on inside out so long as it wasn't of a Friday. And yet, and yet, that strained look on her face, a gnawing sorrow is there all the time. Her very soul is in her eyes, and she would give worlds to be in the privacy of her own familiar chamber where, giving way to tears, she could have a good cry and relieve her pent-up feelings. Though not too much, because she knew how to cry nicely before the mirror. You are lovely, Gertie, it said. The paley light of evening falls upon a face infinitely sad and wistful. Gertie McDowell yearns in vain. Yes, she had known from the first that her daydream of a marriage has been arranged, and the wedding bells ringing for Mrs. Reggie Wiley, T.C.D., because the one who married the older brother would be Mrs. Wiley, and in the fashionable intelligence Mrs. Gertrude Wiley was wearing a sumptuous confection of grey trimmed with expensive blue fox was not to be. He was too young to understand. He would not believe in love, a woman's birthright. The night of the party long ago in stores, he was still in short trousers, when they were alone and he stole an arm round her waist, she went white to the very lips. He called her little one in a strangely husky voice and snatched a half-kiss, the first, but it was only the end of her nose, and then he hastened from the room with a remark about refreshments. Impetuous fellow! strength of character had never been Reggie Wiley's strong point, and he who would woo and win Gertie McDowell must be a man among men, but waiting, always waiting to be asked, and it was leap year too, and would soon be over. No Prince Charming is her beau ideal to lay a rare and wondrous love at her feet, but rather a manly man with a strong, quiet face, who had not found his ideal, perhaps his hair slightly flecked with grey, and who would understand, take her in his sheltering arms, strain her to him, and all the strength of his deep, passionate nature, and comfort her with a long, long kiss. It would be like heaven. For such a one she yearns this balmy summer eve, with all the heart of her she longs to be his only, his affianced bride for riches for poor, and sickness and health till death us to part, from this to this day forward. And while Edie Bro and while Edie Boardman and while Edie Boardman was with little Tommy behind the pushcar, she was just thinking, would the day ever come when she would call herself his little wife to be? Then they could talk about her till they went blue in the face. Bertha Supple too and Edie, the spitfire, because she would be twenty-two in November. She would care for him with creature comforts, too, for Gertie was womanly wise, and knew that a mere man liked that feeling of hominess. Her griddle cakes done to a golden brown hue, and Queen Anne's pudding of delightful creaminess, had won golden opinions from all, because she had a lucky hand, also for lighting a fire, a dredge in the fine self-raising flour, and always stir in the same direction, then cream the milk and sugar and whisk well the white of eggs, though she didn't like the eating part, 
when there were any people that made her shy, and often she wondered why you couldn't eat something poetical like violets or roses, and they would have a beautifully appointed drawing-room with pictures and engravings and the photograph of Grandpa Giltrap's lovely dog, Gary Owen, that almost talked, it was so human, and chintz covers for the chairs, and that silver toast-rack in Clary's summer jumble sales like they have in rich houses. He would be tall with broad shoulders, she had always admired tall men for a husband, with glistening white teeth under his carefully trimmed sweeping moustache, and they would go on the continent for their honeymoon, three wonderful weeks, and then, when they settled down in a nice, snug, and cosy little homely house, every morning they would both have brekkie, simple but perfectly served, for their own two selves, and before he went out to business he would give his dear little wifey a good hearty hug, and gaze for a moment deep down into her eyes.